yeah. I love my HBCU. And Bob, I love it, love it. I love it, love it. I love my HBCU. And man, I hope my team they won one. I hope my team they won one. Yeah, man. I hope my team they won one. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I tune into the HBCU Sports Lab to see if my team won a loss. If they lost, I'm quiet as a mouth. But if they won, keep tab. Uh, I'ma do the dab, yeah. Dr. Cavill, he know what he be talking about. Talking about. Mike and Charles, they know what they be talking about. Talking about. They compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they won a loss. Yeah. And who the ball, who the ball. This is Dr. Bill with Inside HBC Sports Lab. We might watch the Charles Bishop. Mike is literally on the road. I mean, when I say on the road, I mean on the road. But he's fighting everything and he's gotten in here. And you know what Charles does. He brings it hot and heavy. So welcome to episode 249 of Sports Lab radio show and podcast. The show that's covering the sporting HBCU diaspora. All things HBCU sports from institutions large and small. From the NEIA to the NCAA, we share insights and information on the HBCU sports culture and HBCU athletic aesthetics to facilitate the story of HBCU athletic programs in the business of HBCU sports. I'm your host, Dr. Kenyatta Pavilion, along with my co-host, Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. We're filming from our studio, home studios, and sending a signal live to Case Waste 1230 AM studios with the Texas Radio Hall of Famer, Ralph Cooper, in the beautiful home of Texas Southern University from Houston, Texas. Let me start out with none other than Mike Washington. How you doing today? He's probably catching Pretty good. Okay. Pretty good. How you doing, Doc? I'm hanging How I'm you hanging doing? In. Not too bad. Not too bad. Got a little delay, but we'll, we'll, we'll get all the tomfoolery out. We'll do that. Let me go with Charles Bishop. Mr. Bishop, how are you doing today? Doing well, Doc. Doing well. Enjoyed a little baseball this weekend. Enjoyed a little golf. And here we are. It's Tuesday before you know it. Tuesday, Thursday before you know it. More HBC, HBCU news to get to. Let me get it. Give me a shout out to hashtag Yard Talk HTX. That's Yard Talk Houston, Texas. Rambling alum that uh, does a lot of NIL on Twitter there. Awesome. Asked a lot of good questions and uh, had a good discussion going on between yesterday, particularly this morning, just about some of the business side of HBCU sports. So follow me over there on uh, Twitter, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, D-R-K-E-N-Y-A-T-T-A-C-A-V-I-L. You never know what kind of dialogue we get into to make sure you understand the business of sports, particularly how it affects uh, HBCU sports program. With that being said, man, it's that time for need for speed. I know y'all want to talk a little bit about the diamonds. We'll get into that. I'm still on this speedy. You know, we got North Carolina a and out there, men's and women, especially the men's program, what they did on the indoor. But we got a case of the Joneses over here. Howard University on the women's side, four by four relay final with the qualifying time of 334.21. It was a neat record uh, at the Texas relay, Jessica Cabilla, Philadelphia. Amina Salih, Will Willington Borough, New Jersey, I should say. Zama Scott, Georgetown, Ghana, and Jessica Wright, Durham, North Carolina, capped off the weekend winning event with a new school mark of 332.89. The four Bison broken their previous record set back at the 2021 NCAA East preliminary round. These women have some speed, which was 33, 333.98, I should say. When you talk about that time, uh, they also broke school records, respectively, in individuals of each. That's Gabia and Wright in terms of just what they're doing. Gabia shattered the school bench mark in the 100 meter dash preliminary clock in a qualifying time, 11:48. Easter Story held the record at 40 for 49 years, 11:50. Mm. In the final, the Philadelphia native reset the record again with a fifth place finish Saturday. March 26th, producing 11.25 marks. So these folks, these ladies are getting it done. I had to talk about the need for speed just coming off the TSU relay, uh, PVA, AMU relays, or like they say, PV relays down there. 
a lot going on. I know we'll touch back into some other things, but I want to show out a little bit for the need for speed, boy. I, I like it when they get the morale, the track, put, putting them up, picking them up, as they say, they put them there. Let me go to you, Charles, with that in mind. What's some news that you want to talk about today? Yeah, let me switch it. Share anything about that, uh, what the women at Howard got done? Oh, no, kudos to uh, Howard's uh, uh, women's track team, uh, especially when you talk about uh, the, the longstanding history uh, that our, our HBCU uh, uh, track teams have, uh, and they're coming back to that to that uh, uh, sort of a time period where you, you start to see them make noise again. Of course, we had North Carolina A&T last year. Kudos to uh, Howard this year in terms of uh, that meet record. But uh, uh, you can't say enough about uh, what our track programs have been putting out there over the past uh, probably four or five years now. Good point. Good point. Yeah, we've had a rebirth in track. Yeah. Obviously, for a while, you had a Division two level. Don't want to forget St. Augustine in Lincoln, Pennsylvania, what they've been doing out there. They just continue to march through. But now you're seeing some showcase at the Division one level. You had the class of the conference, Alabama State, Prairie be getting it done in some of the uh, – meets around there uh but in terms of seeing this national stage uh kind of rebirth in a lot of ways it's fascinating to see so good points there let me go to you mike what's on your mind today well you know hats off to the howard uh uh four by four uh relay team by by far and i i certainly agree with the resurgence of track but let me switch to bowling okay Howard put it down like four flat tires. Bowling. But so did Alabama State. They went through a they went through a defending champion Prairie View, three straight championships, regular season championship, went through them, beat Southern to claim their next uh SWAC championship. I think it's the last time was 2017. So uh, kudos to the Lady Hornets from Alabama State for bowling. Uh, they took some teams to like seven games to to win. So, you know, kudos to Alabama State and that bowling team and what they've been able to do. Oh, yes, bowling, bowling. I think we got a bowling championship in the MEAC. What you say, Charles? Oh, let's switch gears a little bit, take take. Heads towards baseball. Swag Baseball Weekly honors the Swag Heads tab. Alabama A&M's Jared Trivett and Jose Figueroa for Swag Baseball Weekly honors for their outstanding performances this week. Uh, hitter of the week, Trivett won one of three and added a run to help secure an 8-5 victory for the Bulldogs on Friday. Went to a five and delivered a home run, two RBIs and two runs in game two of the series. Trivett would save his best for last as he went three for five with a home run and seven RBIs lead Alabama A&M to a 15-9 to win over Jackson State to close out the three-game series. Alabama A&M baseball with a uh, series uh, winner over Jackson State this past weekend. And the pitcher of the week was Figueroa, Jose Figueroa. He threw seven innings, only allowing one earned run while striking out seven batters to help the Bulldogs defeat Jackson State 8-3 to on Friday the first outing of the three-game series. So uh, shout-out to Alabama a and baseball with that uh, series victory over Jackson State this past weekend. Yeah, kudos to uh, Alabama a and the Bulldogs. That was, that was big to get two out of three from Jackson State. Obviously, Jackson State had that first weekend match uh, against um, Bethune-Cookman. Tough match up there. Looked like they may be getting it back into business, splitting, but that – you know how it is, you know, especially at home. You want to get yeah. two out of three. Yeah. And I think you're going to see that a lot more this year in the SWAC. The ability to sweep is probably not going to be there much very often. Right. You want to get, you know, two out of three in the series. You can do that. Oftentimes it's going to come down, I think, more often than not this year, that rubber match. We've seen that yeah. on Texas Southern and Pine Bluff, another case of a rubber match. So you're going to see that quite often. You had Brown and Southern going into that rubber match. And, again, we'll go in a little detail, break down in terms of the record status of everybody. Look who's hot, who's not. A great call when you talk about uh, Alabama A&M uh, getting the accolades as they deserve in terms of swag players of the week, uh, according to what they were able to do. They're 
get back in the mix, man. This swag race, the depth of baseball in this conference and division, I think it's going to be fascinating to keep up week to week. Usually, you know, you have the baseball geeks, baseball fandom that kind of get into it. But if these races become a little more competitive, uh, we might get a gain a little more interest there. It's like Mike's had to drop off. Before I get in there, because I'm going to go back a little bit over that bowling that Mike jumped out, but I'm going to do a little something else before we get into that. Let me give a shout-out to the lab listeners. Who's in the building today? We have Chad Cooper. Good evening, professors. Yes, indeed. Ricky Burden says good evening. Anthony Johnson, he's getting all in here. That news with Shaq's son at LSU in the transfer portal. Possible family reunion at TSU. That's interesting. I haven't heard any news. So I can't tap, tap, tip my cap in terms of what's going on there, but I'll let you know if I see him on campus or <laughs> at the plans of the works. Who knows? You know, that Southern seems to find a way to get in that transfer portal and reload in terms mm. of what they did. They do have two players. One of them was a senior, so he couldn't come back. Uh, but they had another one that had a COVID year, and they decided to take their chances in NBA drafting, uh, take their talent to the professional ranks. So uh, that will deal away with a little bit of the golf and the height that they had down low in the post. So it'll be fascinating to see what that, that looks like. Dr. Roderick Byron Holmes talked about how girls made it out of the East region in the 4 by 400 last year. That's right. That's right. Uh, they, were, they were tight. Chad Cooper wants to get into a little issue. Baseball had a big weekend at the new Roger Cadon Fieldhouse dedication for the Grand Fram Series TSU Next. Chad Cooper, I couldn't find this out, and I was trying to find it out. Is it actually a new field house, or is it the dedication that is new, or is it a combination of the two? And I was trying to really get that information. So if you can share that, it would be fascinating to dig a little deeper uh, in regards to that. But I know this. When I saw the facility, the highlights, uh, it looks tremendous. We can say that without a doubt <laughs> whether uh, that is the case. Chuck Hunt says HBC All-Star Basketball Game will be aired Sunday on CBS in New Orleans. And, and you know, Lakefront Arena, and that is 3 p.m. Central. Thank you for that interest. Information, certainly plan to check that out as you have some of the talented players we've seen throughout the SWAC NIAC discussed out of the SIC, CIAA and some NIA programs there. Lonnie Shaw says, North Carolina is rocking Duke versus Carolina Final Four. I don't care about schools built on slave labor. Ah, oh, fascinating. <laughs> I must say, wow. I do agree. I do agree with you, Lonnie. I'm not sure how to put it out there like that, but uh, it happens to be the truth. So <laughs> can't Damn. say you're lying. I cannot say you're lying. But you did go straight to the point there. I wasn't really thinking that much about the matchup, but you're right. There are a lot of people that are fascinating about the uniqueness of that game. Karen Griffin says bowling. Yes, we got a little bowling love, and that'll give me a chance before I go back and shout out some more people in here. North Carolina and t remember, they are still in the NEAC for bowling, and they got it done. They defeated Delaware State, North Carolina a and State, won the 2022 NEAC Bowling Championship Sunday afternoon at Penn Boys at the Beach. With a 4-0 victory over Delaware State, uh, shut them out, skunk. Top seeded Aggies ranked number five in the National 10 Pin Coaches Association. That is NTCA for those that may know. Top 25 poll, won the second straight MEAC championship, third out of the last four years, and seventh overall. Getting it done. North Carolina NT State also earned the MEAC's automatic bid to the NCAA Bowling National Championship. The selection show will air on Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time, live NCAA. So we'll get a chance to know where Alabama State, North Carolina A&T, where they'll be seated in this tournament. Kudos to the Aggies and the Hornets in terms of what was looking at there. Let me get a shout out before we uh, get into our first break and come back and, and take a deeper dive a little bit about this baseball. Uh, don't forget Domino's, uh, R.B. Parker. Fam, you pro day, yes, pro day was me. We joked a little bit that coming in. They said 30 <laughs> NFL scouts were down there. I think Charles was either trying to count to see how many were there or did they show up after Coach Prime says, uh, this is not a good look. This is not a good look. <laughs> I, I'm not saying that, but, but you know, the Jackson State fans, oh, they, they, they don't tease fans about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. That was, that was, I can't put that on. I tried. I tried. James Knox says, 
V U U for life. Yes, yeah, double A in the house. Stephen A. Miller in the house. What's up, Doc? Juan C. Hill. Yeah, we're going to shout out some folks today. Reginald Johnson, greetings, good brothers. Uh, hashtag I T H B C U S L. Go ahead. Is that a DCU baseball fan in the house? I don't know. Watching from Montgomery, Alabama, A D Drew. Chris Tucker, Anthony Weston, A&M is about to lose Johnson to the transfer port. Mm. Yeah, it happens. It happens. It just means you can go pick some people up. It happens. SBB TSU is watching. G. Boom Holly is always in the house. None other than Donna Glover gives a nice wave out there representing Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated as well as Premier A&M University. All that she does. Edwin Dwight Moore. Good evening, Dean and professors. Yes, yes. Troy Lamont Coleman is in there. Excellent point, Doc. I appreciate that. I try. I try. Reginald Kennedy. Who else we got in here? Winzo Phillips. Thanks, Coach Prime. Edwin Dwight Moore. Hell of a bowling championship this past Sunday. SU versus Bama State. Every roll and every pin matter. Congratulations to the Horn slipping out with the seventh game victory. Boy, yeah, that's Anytime you get those competitive matches, I don't know what ever level it is, it doesn't matter. It is great. The aesthetics in terms of what you see, just the pulsing things that come out of it. Reginald Johnson, Family Pro Day, possibly benefited from SU Pro Day following day two. Okay, yeah, yeah, maybe. I'm not sure Florida State right now has a whole bunch of – I'm about to say, more, the more they, prospects they are at FAMU now. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's more prospects yeah, just, at FAMU right Hey, now. as you said earlier, you know, uh, <laughs> as Lonnie Shaw said, just keep it real, just keep it real. <laughs> Word on the street is that Coach Cone, our native future, home might be back at a and Y'all sure y'all want Coach Maynard? I'm sure y'all might want something bigger than that, the way y'all talking about where y'all want to go. But, yeah, certainly – he is a big time favorite son, quarterback there. Uh, he's won everywhere he's win. And so I wouldn't be surprised if they make a run at him. But I'm not sure if that's in the eyes of what your athletic director wants uh, going into the Colonial Athletic Association. I, I'd be interested to see would they see a coach that came from AT or a coach in the SWAC that obviously won a championship there, won at once from Salem State not so well at Hampton, is that the direction they're going? Or will they look for a proverbial bigger name? I'll be interested to see uh, what that may look at in terms of that. a and has to get coaches first, laugh out loud. <laughs> yeah, he's going back to the pink scooter. That's right, Dr. Will, SCU, who? Yeah, exactly. You know, we, we don't have no love for all that. We HBCU hot dog friends around here. Let's get into this break, and we'll be right back and see if we can get – Mike watching the back in the pitch. You see, he trying to sneak in there. We're going to give him a break. We'll come back right after this. Yeah. Oh, that spin class was brutal. Well, you can try using the Buick's massaging seat. Oh, yeah, that's nice. Can I use Apple CarPlay to put some music on? Sure. It's wireless. Pick something we all like. Okay, hold on. What's your Buick's Wi Fi password? Buick Envision 2021. Oh, you should pick something stronger that's really predictable. That's a really tight spot. Don't worry. I used to hate parallel parking. Me too. Hey. You really outdid yourself. Yes, we did. The all new Buick Envision, an SUV built around you, all of you. Since 2002, Empowerment Resources, Inc., a nonprofit organization, has empowered more than 1,500 youth and adults in Duval and surrounding counties. Through its programs, Journey into Womanhood, Girls Mentoring, Life Skills for Teens, and Parenting Education Coaching. To get involved with programs, volunteer, or donate, visit www.empowermentresourcesinc.org. Follow us on social media, facebook.com forward slash empowerment.resources and instagram.com forward slash empowermentjax. It's never too early to plant the seed, to share the tradition, and instill a sense of pride in your HBCU with your little ones. HBCU Pride and Joy Children's Boutique helps you share your school spirit with a wide selection of adorable kids apparel and accessories officially licensed from your favorite HBCU. Visit HBCUPrideJoy.com and follow us on all social media at HBCU Pride Joy on Facebook and Twitter. The Cuvée Group is a Florida-based marketing and training consulting firm. We help businesses communicate to their target audience and engage them in conversation. We also help to expand their audiences 
which will ultimately result in growth for those organizations. In addition to being a certified constant contact specialist, my colleagues and I are also certified in John Maxwell Leadership Principles. We use these proven principles to conduct workshops, training, and private coaching sessions for individuals and companies looking to take things to the next level. Contact us to schedule a free consultation. Issues today, don't delay, call Cuvay. Compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they wanna lock yeah. and who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor Yes Sir. Yes, yeah, this is Dr. Bill with Inside HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles. Bishop. We got Mike Washington snuck back in here. With that, I wanted to give a shout out to Dr. Kiki Baker Barnes. You know, we go back when she came to um, the HBCU ARC Athletic Research Consortium. Man, it goes back maybe a decade now. She was the athletic director at Dillard. As many of you no, she was serving as the interim commissioner of the Gulf Coast Athletic Conference. Um, they had lost Xavier, if you would, but then they turned around and added several schools, including Suno, and a big one was Wiley College out of the Red River Athletic Conference going over to Gulf Coast Athletic Conference. Well, she is making history as the first Black African-American woman appointed to this position. Founded in 1981, the GCAC is a conference that competes in the National Association of Interclesian Athletics, NAIA, and is a league entirely comprised of historically black colleges and universities, HBCUs, as you know, from Arkansas, Florida, Louisiana, Mississippi, Tennessee, and now Texas. Barnes said, I'm honored to have earned the trust and confidence of my colleagues for the purpose of leading Gulf Coast Athletic Conference into the future. My commitment is to bring creative vision, excellence, direction, Strong partnerships that will advance the conference in the competitive landscape for our student athletes. As I embrace this new opportunity, I'm especially grateful to my colleagues, staff, and student athletes at Dillard University for our collective work in rising from adversity to winning championships and becoming a national model of student athlete success, end quote. Let me go to you, Charles, first. What's your thoughts on the announcement that the interim tag is removed and now we have a full Commissioner and Dr. Kiki Baker Barnes. Uh, it speaks volumes in terms of what they think about Dr. Barnes, uh, uh, Baker Barnes' uh, leadership uh, to take the interim tag off. And anytime uh, you start off the sentence with making history as the first, you know that that, that speaks volumes. That's huge. Uh, I'm looking forward to what she's going to be able to do and uh, continue to do in the GCAC. She is uh, proven uh, in terms of her success as an AD, and uh, really looking forward to. Uh, what she's going to bring to that conference. Before I go to you, Mike, check this out. She's been serving since 2006 as the athletic director at Dillard University, as I said, model program. Throughout this time, she served as the only intercollegiate female athletic director in the state of Louisiana. Wow. Wow. So, <laughs> so for Women's History Month, it's befitting that we celebrate Dr. Kiki Baker Barnes as she continues to make history. That's fascinating. Um, she made history of the first female and black president of Gulf Coast Athletic Conference and as the first black woman commissioner in the National Association of Intercollegiate Athletics, said Dr. Roderick L. Smothers, you know, senior, Philip Under Smith, college president and chairman of the GCAC Council of Presidents. Now she assumes the helm of the GCAC full time and permanently. I have utmost faith that as a commissioner, she will be impeccable steering the conference to new heights and remain a trailblazer in collegiate sports. Yeah, fascinating, fascinating. What are your thoughts on Dr. Kiki Baker Barn, Mike Washington? Man, two things stand out. If you read her bio, it says in her interim, when she had the interim tag, return of champions. She returned several championships to the league. Wow. I'm, I, you can stop right there. Then she's grown the conference. Return of championships, growth of the conference, right there. And it's only fitting that this, this interim tag be removed. I've always been confused about this interim tag, personally, because if somebody is, is going to be the, the commissioner, they're the commissioner. 
in the corporate world, they're the commissioner. I mean, seriously, there's no commissioner or interim tag there. She's proven <laughs> without a I doubt like that she's capable. She she has a confidence. There's no interim whatsoever. She's proven she can do it. Growth the conference right there. Stop right there. Rest, restoration of championships to the conference. Right there. You had me. You had me. She She's unequivocally the best choice. Not because she's a woman, but because she has the goods to do it. So I'm a I'm a big fan. When you told me you uh, had uh, worked with her, networked with her several years ago, I was already sold in. But now, I mean, I mean, it's only fitting. Congratulations, Doctor Barnes. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Yes, this summer the league will stand at eight teams expanding back into Alabama with the addition of Oakwood University into ten. For the first time with Wiley College and the return of athletics of Southern University of New Orleans. That's kudos one for them being able to return to athletics, expanding both East and West. Alabama back there, and then new trailblazer into Texas. Man, that's pretty, pretty high level when you think about that. So I was kind of excited to hear that. Since we're talking about commissioners or leadership of athletic programs, obviously it's come out. North Carolina Central expected to hire alumnus Lewis Skip Perkins as AD. That's happened now. Uh, speak, picking up for Dr. Ingrid Wicker McCree, uh, North Carolina Central's AD since 2008. What are your thoughts on uh, Perkins, Lewis Perkins? You know, he served at Arkansas Pine Bluff, served at Howard University, and I think even had a stint at Hampton, if you would. So he has some experience specifically for HBCUs. Um, so he's had championships during his height. North Carolina Central, what are your thoughts, starting with you, Mike, with this move, uh, with them bringing home a, a favorite son, if you would, to take over the helms at North Carolina Central University in the MEAC? No, I, I, I think, first of all, yeah, it's kind of like, you, you ever heard of the prodigal son from biblical yeah, terms? Yeah, I've heard yeah. of him. <laughs> and, you know, in a different term, so... Uh, I I can't call him Skip Doc, Doctor. You can call him Skip. I can't call him Skip Perkins, but uh, he's a <laughs> he's a dynamic education leader. He has the pedigree. To me, it was only a right decision. He, and not only that, when you go somewhere else and have that experience, you can come back home and share those experiences and grow the institution. So I think it's the right move. I think also it's the timing as well. There's always something about timing of an announcement. I don't know all the ins and outs, but, you know, something about the timing says, you know, speaks volumes as, as well. Before I go to you, Charles, and your thoughts, uh, shout out to Edwin Dwight Moore. Uh, as you talk about the corporate world, he says interim equals corporate contractor. Charles, what are your thoughts on Lewis Skip Perkins as AD of North Carolina Central? Yeah, I think Mike touched on it. You talk about pedigree and uh, no stranger uh, to the job. Uh, we've seen him here in the swag at UAP, UAPB. Uh, won uh, championships there, five championships, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, definitely, I remember basketball and some uh, – some track uh, championships in there. Yeah, women's cross country, men's cross country, women's soccer as well. And then from there to Howard, uh, oversaw uh, the uh, uh, renovation of, of Bird Gymnasium, academic support center. So uh, when you talk about checking the boxes, he definitely checks the boxes. And you bring a, get an opportunity to bring a native son home with ped pedigree. Uh, what's better than that? So uh, kudos to North Carolina Central. Great hire. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Should be fascinating to watch. I want to shout out Chuck Hunt. He says, I watched Dr. Kiki Baker Barnes play basketball in high school at Minden High School in Minden, Louisiana. She was awesome to watch in the early 1990s. She and I graduated from high school the same year in 1993. Chuck always has some interesting perspectives and connections with so many different things. Shout out to who Chuck. Does, who does Chuck that? know in Louisiana? That's Chuck what I'm Louisiana. saying. Who, who, does Chuck, who does Chuck not know? <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Shout out to Carl Edmund. With that being said, let me get in here some MEAC announcers. 2022 ESPNU baseball and softball TV schedule. We're going to get a little MEAC baseball and softball. I like that. I like it. MEAC has announced that the baseball and softball regular season game 
that will be televised live on ESPU on Friday, April 15th. Yeah, North Carolina Central will be in Norfolk, Virginia to take on Norfolk State at the NSU softball field. The first game of the double heaven will be shown live on ESPNU at 11 a.m. ESPNU will be back in Norfolk, Virginia on Friday, April 29th for a baseball game between Delaware State and reigning MEAC champion Norfolk State. A contest that will pit the top two teams in the preseason predicted order to finish. That game will be live on ESPNU at 3 p.m. All games is aired on ESPN Network will also be available through ESPN app on computers, smartphones, tablets, streaming devices to fans who receive their high-speed internet connection or video subscription from an affiliated service provider. I like that. They able to get a little bit of baseball and softball HBCU style out of the VA. That should be fascinating to watch. Let me put a pin in it right here. We're getting to halftime since we're talking about baseball. We'll come back on the other side. I'm going to give you some updates on the baseball uh, games that were played this week. We'll give you where people are in the standings. We'll take a little look at the MEAC squat, even take a gaze at OVC for softball at Tennessee State. No baseball there. And then we'll go to the Big South uh, in terms of North Carolina a and that plays baseball. Hampton and a and on the sophomore side, no Hampton for baseball. Man, it's kind of hard to think about it when you talk about not everybody at the HBC level playing baseball. But you can't say Man, that for I'm the swag. Com- it's 12 deep, 12 deep. <laughs> so we'll get into who's hot and who's not. Stick with us at the half. We'll be back in the third quarter. Or should I say, uh, we're just into the middle relievers. This is the fifth inning. Stick with us. We're going to the bottom right after this break. Supermarket sushi, really? No. Wait, Troy, you work here? I'm never not working. Like head and shoulder scalp shield technology, up to 100% dandruff protection, even between washes. Never not working, huh? (laughs) Oh, Troy, you're such a good teacher. Yeah, I know. (laughs) Never not working. Never not working. Never ever not working. Are you serious? Never not working. Dandruff protection that's never not working. Head and shoulder scalp shield technology. From novice to aficionado, Find yourself here. High quality cigars plus personal customer service. Slow Burn is Waco's only mobile cigar lounge featuring a meticulous curated collection of premium cigars. Visit our website www.slowburnwaco.com That's www.slowburnwaco.com Are you hungry for authentic Caribbean food? Like jerk, chicken, oxtail, red snapper, shrimp, tofu, and rasta pasta? Well, find your way over to Mango's Caribbean Restaurant, 180 Auburn Avenue, right next to Royal Peacock. In downtown Atlanta. Mango's Caribbean Restaurant, open daily from 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. And on Friday and Saturday, we're open till 4 a.m. Come to Mango's and put some spice in your life. Oh, we've got a good Mango's Caribbean Restaurant, 180 Auburn Avenue, right next to Royal Peacock. In downtown Atlanta. For more info or directions, call 404-698-3992. Or log on to mangoscaribbeanrestaurant.com. For instant coupons, text M-A-N-G-O-S to 313131. Tell your mama hungry, papa hungry, brother hungry. Mango's Caribbean Restaurant. Authentic Caribbean cuisine. For 200 years, Montgomery, Alabama has been making history by people who had the courage to stand up for change. Today, this riverfront city has been reborn, embracing the past and looking forward to the future. From the National Memorial for Peace and Justice to the stage of the Alabama Shakespeare Festival, this is where history was and is made. We are proud to call Montgomery home, and together, we can be the change. Press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want a lot, yeah, and who the ball, ball, So listen to Professor, yes sir, yes sir, and pay attention, cause he gon' teach a lesson. This is Dr. Ville with Inside HBC Sports Lab. Since we just talked about the MEAC softball, MEAC baseball and softball in terms of television games, Let's stay with the MEAC and get into some baseball first. Uh, some of the guys that you need to keep your eyes on is Alan Alonzo, 
Uh, Delaware State batting 353 on the season thus far. Uh, Trey Page, Delaware State, 339 batting average, getting it done. And Sebastian Severa, Coppin State is at 333, tied with Ralph Rodriguez. Uh, following out the top five is Ryan Howe at Maryland Eastern Shore with a 328 batting average. Uh, doing pretty good there in terms of some pitches. James DeLoach, uh, three wins from Norfolk State. Uh, Evan Neblet, two wins. Uh, Maryland Eastern Shore, you got Jordan Hamburg matching that, along with Nolan Manzer, as well as Noah Covington. And that is from Coppin State, Norfolk State, and Maryland Eastern Shore, respectively, all with two wins on the early season. It's a close race right now. Nobody is separating themselves. Uh, you have Coppin State at five and three in terms of the conference race, just the game back. Norfolk State and Maryland Eastern Shore are tied at four and four in the conference race. Delaware State two games back at three and five, giving you some ideas. Coppin State is the hottest team going right now, winning two straight games. Um, Norfolk State, even though they're one game back, they have lost two straight in terms of what's going on there. Let me stick with you, Mike Washington, in terms of the MEAC. Can you tell anything yet, or is it just simply too early? Do you like the fact that the competition is still competitive in this four-team MEAC race? I like the uh, – it's the latter. Uh, here's why. You, you talked about some of the individuals. Batting, Coppin State is team batting average of 280. Uh, you got Maryland Eastern Shore, team batting average of 263. Then pitching, Maryland Eastern Shore is the closest team to a ERA of five. Of five. So it's not it's, – it's really too early to tell statistically. You've got some folks that stand out, but it's really too early. This is going to be a competitive conference for sure. You mentioned some of the individuals. The other thing is fielding. Um, man, if you, look at, if, you, if you look at overall fielding, uh, Coppin State is heads and shoulders above the rest in terms of fielding percentage. But I, I'd like to see – I need a couple like more data Defense points. will travel. Defense That's will right. travel. Couple more data points, but Coppin State is looking to be that defensive dude on the block. So we'll see after maybe another week or two where this shakes out. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, Mike. Defense means everything. Uh, Doc, you and I were talking about that this past Sunday watching Texas Southern UAPB, uh, how defense travels. You know, when you can make those routine plays and, and, and not – uh, put, you know, extra runners on base, things of that nature, just simple throws, you know, uh, things of that nature, making the routine plays to where uh, you're not putting more stress on the pitcher. So I, I do keep an eye on, on on fielding percentage, especially as we get a little later into the year, just see what teams are just making just good, solid outs, uh, inning in, inning out. Yeah. Jeff Roberts says, how much does it cost to fund? a D1 baseball program, it really depends on mm -hmm. what you are talking about uh, in terms of are you including facilities, you know, a baseball facility, especially if you're talking about the lights for night games, it can get quite expensive bringing a facility. But scholarship-wise, um, you have the 11.7, which is the weirdest thing to me when you're talking about the NCA of how they break down scholarships. And most times when you talk about these teams, they fold, uh, fielding 27, 30, 35 players on a team. So most players do not get full scholarships. You get some pitches. They may get two-thirds. You have a really good pitcher. You might find a way to try to get a full scholarship. But that's generally not the case, uh, which is going to be interesting when you talk about these new guidelines for the NCA. if I can kind of speak this in uh, as you see the updates to the NCA. I'm intrigued about what this means because, you know, SEC has been pushing uh, about increasing the scholarship limit for baseball uh, in terms of what – and obviously they can afford to do that. But now you're talking about that narrow gap in ability for uh, your mid-major, low-major programs, SWAC programs, if you would, to be able to play uh, with SEC even during some of the preseason games and midweek games it becomes even tougher – uh, if you have teams that have the depth to be able to go 11.7 and above in scholarship. So that's something to keep your eyes on. So I'm fascinated about that framework. Uh, Mike, did you have any comments you wanted to talk about in terms of baseball? I know uh, both of you all are big fans of baseball in a lot of ways, uh, but you've come up through the youth uh, and allowing your sons to play. What have what you seen in terms of just the cost about filling a team at the collegiate level? Yeah, I think um... – 
to, uh, as it, it can become a potential arms race. I don't know what the average scholarship is. I think it was something like 12 4, 12 5, um, or, or what the, the limit is for baseball scholarship. But it says you alluded to its facilities. You also have to consider equipment, you also have to have travel. How competitive are you going to be on the travel schedule? Are you going to play folks outside of uh, outside of, the, of your conference? So, I mean, the SEC is talking some things. I've heard some things, and actually on the West Coast, that they're considering some things as well. Um, because I have some folks that are still yeah, in the baseball. There. Yeah, so the, it it can it can get, and you could have a couple of conferences that have a competitive. There, I use the corporate term competitive advantage if they allow them to increase the scholarship limit. Uh, because if yeah, you look it, at it teams, will change the whole, whole dynamic. Um, you will see the differential in my uh, opinion really explode between these mid-major, low-major programs if you see SEC, Pac-12, and the like, being able to expand the scholarship levels. That's on top of the ability, obviously, to pay uh, that yeah. you have these programs doing uh, for the cost of living that they're able to do now. So they're already doing that, but then you add in the fact that you can spread the scholarship, that's something to really keep your eyes on when you talk about the movement in the SWAC and um, how this conference with 12 member now is really stretched out. So that's kind of fascinating and one of the things I'm always wanting to keep my eyes on. Charles, did you want to get in it? In, in, in no, that, that's, that? that's a, a really good question in terms of what, what does it cost to fund? And especially, Mike, you touched on the transportation aspect, especially if you're trying to play uh, a schedule that uh, "quote unquote" makes your team better. Uh, play at those those power five teams, things of that nature. Yeah. Because that's that's a very interesting debate, especially with regards to Jackson State baseball, because uh, Jackson State does play two good. They will play Russ. They will play a lot of Division two, or they will play a few Division two teams uh, regionally. Uh, but that's uh, always a very interesting debate in terms of. Does that catch up uh, to Jackson State baseball, especially when they get into swag tournament play in terms of who they're playing? Are they getting better during the course of the season? So that's a interesting uh, uh, data point to kind of take a look at in terms of transportation and what does it look like? What is, what is the expanding of the scholarships uh, look like for baseball for HBCUs? Then they also jump in there and play one of those NIA programs, uh, which have a different scholarship limit. But Part of that is also trying to get more games at home. One, so you can get, you know, reduce the travel costs that you talk about. And you give your fan base some exposure and ability to celebrate the team uh, beyond those weekend conference games. So it's that unique mix about how you do that in competitive schedule. We see that with Alabama State, but then Cookman. Uh, but they play in a region uh, coming out of Florida with all those Division One teams, obviously Alabama, Georgia. So the vicinity of where you can play those schools is also uh, unique for them to be able to do that. You kind of see that with Texas with so many Division One programs where it's easy to put them on the schedule and get that Tuesday, Wednesday uh, early ride out for classes, play the game, get them back that night so they can get back into class the next day. Uh, and so that, that unique mix is always important there. Before we get in this break, I did want to give some love to softball and at least give you some updates on the standings. Then we'll come back and get into the squack where uh, everybody say the action is in a lot of ways to let you know what's going on there. Fascinated about this race. I just find myself Friday, Saturday nights, and Sunday nights looking at those scores to see who was able to get it done, getting into my Twitter feed, going into the websites and seeing who was able to get the big win, who had some tough losses. Did you get to that rubber match who was able to get it done on Sunday when that comes down to it? Some teams looking to see, can they get the sweep? Can some team find a way to get a win to keep things going? But before we do that for the SWAT softball standings, you have Morgan State sitting at the top of the conference, 5-1 and one early part of the season, 13-10 and 10 overall winning record, two straight wins in terms of the win streak. Behind them is another Maryland team. Maryland Eastern Shore sitting at 4-1, and one, just 7-18 and 18 overall. But you have Howard, 3-2, and 12-18, and 18, uh, winning two games. Maryland Eastern Shore had won one. one. You have um, North Carolina Central at three and two. Norfolk State follows them at three and three. South Carolina State, along with Norfolk State, we just talked about also two and four, but losing two straight games. Delaware State, two and four. They were able to get some big wins 
as they uh, were on a losing streak and got their first two wins of the season as they came in 0-18, 2-18 now. Coppin State is struggling, 0-5 overall, 0-21, uh, 21 straight losses, as you can imagine, uh, just trying to figure it out. We'll see a losing streak that was stopped on the men's side in the sweat that we talk about. But for softball, beautiful to see the MIAC has all eight teams that are able to fill the softball team. Let's take this last break, get back, and give you some updates on the sweat. Before we do that, I did want to talk about these independent softball programs. You have in the Big South, Hampton and North Carolina A&T. Uh, Hampton is just 3-6 and six in the conference race. North Carolina A&T is 2-7, 12-19, 11-17. and, seven, uh, 12 and 19, 11, 17. That is 8th and 10th, respectively. Uh, tough race there. OVC, Tennessee State has a softball team. They're sitting at 2-4 and four, um, um, in terms of what they're doing in the race. Sitting at 8th spot. That is of 11 teams. And you saw the eighth and tenth spot. That is of ten teams in the softball uh, for the Big South. Take this break. We'll be right back and give you some updates as we get in the swag and give you that update on the men's side for baseball with North Carolina A and T zero and three on the season nine and fourteen. That is Big South. They're in the eleventh spot, sitting in last. A uh, five-game losing streak. Stick with us. We'll be right back after yep. this break and get into the swag baseball. Charmin Ultra Soft has so much cushiony softness, it's hard for your family to remember. They can use less. Sweet pillows of softness. This is soft. Holy Charmin. Oh, excuse me. Roll it back, everybody. Sorry. Charmin Ultra Soft is so cushiony soft, you'll want more. But it's so absorbent, you can use less. So it's always worth it. Now, what did we learn about using less? You gotta roll it back, everybody. <laughs> we all go. Why not enjoy the go with Charmin? From novice to aficionado, find yourself here. High quality cigars plus personal customer service with Slow Burn. Visit our website, www.slowburnwaco.com. Slow Burn is Waco's only mobile cigar lounge featuring a meticulous curated collection of premium cigars. It's more than a mobile lounge. It's an environment and an experience rich in history, luxury, and personality. An elegant extension of any celebration occasion. It's the perfect escape and meeting place. A space where you can relax or enjoy a shared passion. Have Slow Burn plan your next big event or before you are planning to celebrate your win over your athletic rival, you can shop our collections at www.slowburnwaco.com. But if they want to tap, uh, I'm going to do the dab, yeah. Press the analytic data with your hip-hop. If you know them like I know them, they're going to tell you if your team, if they want a lot, yeah. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, yes sir, yes sir, and pay attention, because he's going to teach a lesson. This is Dr. Bill with Inside HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. Let's get into some softball first. If it's not dead, east side, west side, to say, uh, getting it done in so many different ways. You got Texas Southern sitting at 8-1, and one. Southern is 6-3. and three. Uh, with Prairie View A&M, 6-3 and three as well. Alcorn State, 4-5. and five. Grambling State, 2-7. and seven. Pine Bluff is picking up the back at 8-1-8 eight, eight in terms of what's going on there. On the east side, interesting race going on there when you talk about that perspective. Let me go to you, Mike. Give me an update. What do you think about the West Division of the SWAC in softball? And <laughs> It's softball. <clears throat> it's all about TSU. I mean, seriously. Yeah, it's been I mean, about TSU. It's been it's a it's, 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and nothing they, <laughs> nah, No, seriously, nothing safe. I wish mm -hmm. I could ask. So, man, if you look at batting average, fielding percentage, TSU, TSU, seriously, it is all about TSU this year. What are they, 8-1 and one in the SWAC? They, uh, they, yeah, they're, slugging they're, they're slugging per their slugging percentage doc is off the charts right now. So it's all about TSU right now. Yeah, they they did and they rebounded from that tough loss to Southern. And that was on the road where they took it to Southern and it sits at six and three. Really solid to be able to get two, two out of three games down there. 
Um, obviously, when you talk about the East Division, you have Alabama State sitting at six and three. Six and three. Valley is sitting at five and three. Yeah, Valley, Mike, that Valley yep. is sitting at five and three. Jackson State behind them at five and four. Bethune Cookman uh, surprised some. They're just sitting at four and five. Like FAMU is four and five at Alabama A and M at two and six in terms of what's going on there. Any thoughts in terms of West East for softball, Charles? Uh, I think it still resides with Texas Southern over in the West, but it does bring up a, a curious <laughs> question for me uh, in terms of uh, what is the secret in the sauce with Texas Southern and their softball program? Is it the, uh, the, the the number of players that they have an opportunity to recruit here in Texas, a huge softball state, or, or what is the case with regards to Texas Southern? Because year in, year out, we always are talking about them uh, in terms of being one of the better softball programs in the sweat. Yeah, that's yeah. a great point. Uh, a couple of things that stand out to me. This is a, uh, the assistant coach that took over the head job, so they've been able to do it over two coaches. Uh, obviously, she's just taken over the last couple of years. Hadn't been able to get the ultimate prize with the championship in the postseason, but regular season she continues to do what uh, Texas Southern has dominated. The other interesting thing to me is they don't have a quote-unquote home field on campus. They play yeah. at the park. Yeah. More apart and still able to get it done. But, yes, there's so much softball played around this region that they have a really ch good chance to get a lot of quality players. The other thing that I think they've really done really well is packaging um, and recruiting high academic, uh, talented softball players. So they're able to also make sure that those players get uh, academic scholarships uh, to partner with some of their athletic scholarships which to me has given them the depth that you don't see with a lot of teams in the SWAC, particularly uh, in the West. You see it to some degree uh, with the talent in the East Division over the different years, but they've been one of the most consistent programs. Let's go into baseball where it gets really interesting with Bethune Cookman. Yeah. Had their first loss. They only won a losing streak. They had reeled off five in a row in the conference, uh, but Alabama State was able to get it done, at least get one game uh, to not get swept. So they sit in the second spot at four and two. A couple of teams sitting at three and three, FAMU and Alabama A&M. A&M got some big victories when you think they improved the three and three, 500 in the season. Able to take two out of three at home against Jackson State. We haven't seen that in a while. And Valley sits in two and four in terms of the East. Let me go to the West uh, where Texas Southern uh, able to take two or three. Pine Bluff has improved, uh, but they were able to get two or three and get it done. Uh, two straight games after they lost their first one. Prairie View and m had a tough loss. They were 3-3 three three on the season, thinking they'd maybe get some momentum, get the sweep at home, uh, played a tough one in the second match. So you can see that Alcorn had not given up the season, although they came in 0-5 and, and were 0-16 on the season. But they got their first win of the season, a thrilling uh, game that got done on the road against Prairie View to improve the 1-5. Credit to the Braves to get it done. Uh, but Prairie View, uh, maybe wasted opportunity. We'll see how much that game may come back to on them over the year. But you have Arkansas Pine Bluff that drops to three and three. Grambling drops to three and three after they lost two out of three to Southern. A chance for them to make a little bit of statement. Southern, you thought they were out of it? No, they're just sitting at three and three. So you got a gauntlet of teams at 500 in the middle on the west side. This is one side to keep your eyes on. I see you shaking your head, Mike. I'm going to go with you first, then I go to Charles as he starts to shake his head, trying to figure it all out, give us some data points, drop us some thoughts. What do you got, Mike? Remember remember when we announced Bethune and Fan were coming into the SWAT? We were talking about football. But then we went to baseball. We said, where does the pendulum swing for baseball? In the words of Denny Green, we all they are who we thought they were. Bethune, <laughs> right now, number one, FAMU's number three, Alabama State's number two. The one caveat is, what the heck has happened to Jackson State? Usually, they are in the tops of the East. They normally have the highest batting percentage, the, the top in slugging percentage. That's the one surprise. The other thing is, Texas Southern slumped off a little bit. They have since found baseball again. They five and one in the swag. And they're leading, they are leading the league in fielding percentage and batting and batting average. 
team batting average. So a, a lot that we expected, but some some surprises. So I'm like, this is going to be a very interesting as we get into the real meat of the season. Yeah. Yeah, very, very Williams comes in here. Go Jags. Yeah, took two out of three from Grambling. I saw you. Very, I know y'all had a good time down there with the festivities. Boy, they know how to get it done. I can't wait to go back to Baton Rouge for a baseball game over there on the block. Uh, yeah. Barry, Barry will take care of me. I know he will. Yes, you finally has competition in the East. Oh, talk a little noise. Yeah, just, <laughs> just couldn't help yourself. Had to get it in. Remember, it yeah. Once he said, what's up with PB softball? Yeah, they're struggling a little bit. They usually are able to at least stay a step yep. or two behind. And then they had that year where they got on uh, Texas Southern not to be. But back to the baseball uh, in terms of this, before I go to you and Charles, your thoughts, Gabe Vasquez batting 453. Jeremy Gaines, Texas Southern University, batting 435. C.J. Castillo, Texas Southern, batting, batting 394. Hill, Jackson State says don't get the bats down too bad. Uh, so we got one guy out there at least at 373. And then you have Fan Grant Royal, 368, to give you some ideas. And then you got the home run. Jonathan Thomas of Texas Southern University with five home runs, and he's not even in the top batting average. Let you know what they're getting done over there. Uh, Cameron Buford, uh, Gramlin, five home runs. Corey King of Alabama State with five home runs. Jared Triplett, Alabama a and with five home runs. But we got some hitters. Michael Godot, yeah. Texas Southern with four home runs uh, in terms of uh, early season. Boy, these folks are swinging it back. We'll get and give you some updates in terms of pitcher side after Charles gives some of his updates. What are your thoughts, Charles? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the early surprises, I think, is Jackson State. Uh, I, I know that they've had a couple of season-ending injuries uh, uh, that have really kind of rocked the roster, but, but they've gotten off to a slow start uh, with uh, bethune Cookman sweeping and then losing a series to Alabama a &M. So I think uh, some, some early cause for concern for the Jackson State baseball team, but we'll see how they progress uh, through the rest of the season. But I think the story thus far – has been just Texas Southern is beating the cover off the ball. You know, they're batting yeah. 331 as a team. They got uh, three out of the top five guys uh, in the conference in terms of batting average. And I know I looked at this stat and I had to look back twice. And it was like, is that right? They've already stolen 117 bases. They're 117 yeah. out of 135. Yeah. And, you know, it was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a second, 117 out of – we ain't even at the halfway point yet. So – you know, they're, they're, they are yeah. really an exciting offensive team in terms of what they're getting, uh, what they've been able to do. But, you know, normally we see Texas Southern kind of start off slow and they build that momentum up and get really hot in the swag tournament. But to see them jump out to this uh, hot start early, uh, I tell you what, it's going to be fun, uh, that race over there in the swag West. Based on the new numbers, they have become the new Jackson State, to be honest. Hey, he does look Jackson State yeah. You're right. Yeah, You're this right. is the type of numbers that Jackson State would put up. Yeah, great point. We've always known that they, they like to play the, the small ball, yeah. like speed around yeah. the bases. But if you can do both, speed around the bases, play a little small ball, and sweep the fences, yeah. this should be entertaining. This may be something to keep your eyes on. As you talked about, about leading the nation in stolen bases and top couple of guys up there, you got Jonathan Thomas with 32 stolen bases. Justin Cooper, Texas Southern, with 23 stolen bases. Jatavius Melton, the Jackson State, has 16. Jeremy Gaines, Texas Southern, has 15. And Christopher Patterson, 14. Man, look at that gap. 32 stolen bases by Jonathan Thomas. What is he doing? Right. And then you sneak in, you be like, oh, well, this is Justin Cooper, Texas Southern. I'll put up 23 just to make hey, it interesting. What? One data point to be mindful of. It doesn't show up for now. Pitching. You have three Alabama State pitchers. They are historically a good pitching team. You have three Alabama State pitchers with ERAs below three. That will show its rear, that will rear its head toward the middle end of the season, and particularly when you get into conference play. It's not showing up now, but it <laughs> will show its head. Yeah, I see Breon Pooler uh, only has a 1.50 ERA. Exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I see him. Exactly. There. Yeah. Yeah, that's nice. That's nice. Think about that Alabama State with them cooking matchup. It could be something special. We just saw what happened is waiting until the second, since second half of the season when it flipped. You got Samar Page, Grambling at 231. You talked about under three. You have Peyton Harris. 
Alabama State at 242. Jordan Martinez for Texas Southern show that they can pitch a little bit too is at three. Yeah. And then you have Juan Morlanda, uh, Jackson State at 3.4. In terms of wins, Breon Pula, Alabama State with four. Austin King, Alabama State with three. Lewis Lifthrat, uh, Bethune Cookman at three. Juan Morlando, Jackson State also with three wins. And Eric Gonzalez, Jackson State with three wins. So it's going to be fascinating to keep up with this. Uh, we'll give you uh, some strikeouts here. Shamar Page with 56 early on in the season. Juan Merlando continues to get his name in the mix with 45. Eric Gonzalez, Jackson State at 42. Interesting to see that you hear Jackson State a little more on the pitching side. but Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Which is a little different, too. Yeah. Um, so we'll see and continue to look. It is early. You only had two series it's played early. this time. We hadn't even at the halfway mark. But it's fascinating to watch on this. You can't get this type of baseball information on the SWAC or HBCUs anywhere else. So we're happy to give it to you. But that'll do it for the show today. Uh, just giving you those updates and those records. Fascinating, fascinating information. So kudos to both of y'all being able to break a lot of that down, giving those extra data points. So I want to say thank you for the listeners to Inside HBC Sports Lab. Make sure you share our podcast with your friends and or colleagues. I am Dr. Cavill. Uh, that's hold, hold up, Doc. Go ahead. Well, one thing. TV relays this week. The unveiling of the memorial for the four track and field star that died in February of 2000. Um, it was an unveiled at the PV, uh, uh, PV relays. And those players were, uh, those runners were Jerome Jackson, uh, uh, Houston Watson, uh, Vernon James, and Samuel uh, Simmons. Uh, Coach uh, Hoover Wiggins, of course, he survived, but the four players unfortunately perished in the accident. So unveiling of the memorial, a big moment in PV history. So thank you for the opportunity to uh, to let me uh, jump that in. That was a very sentimental and very sad uh, emotional moment at the uh, relays. Yes, I'm most certainly glad that you got that in. We started it with the women. Uh, in terms of how what they're able to do, and then we ended with the PB Raiders, a little dedication. So I'm glad you put that in. And it's right at the entrance, prominent place and position. Well done for a fallen Prairie and then Panthers uh, in terms of that. So I'm glad that you're able to get that in. I am Dr. Guignata Cavill, the Dean of HBC Sports, coming from inside the lab in the College of HBC Sports with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. Again, we thank you for listening to Dr. Bill's Inside HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. Every Tuesday and Thursday, you know, right here at 6 o'clock. We look forward to you on Thursday as we discuss the latest news in the lab. Might sneak in and give you a little guest to give you some updates on some things going around. HBCU landscape. Follow me, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill. Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. That's D-R-K-E-N-Y-A-T-T-A-C-A-V-I-L. Again, that's D-R-K-E-N-Y-A-T-T-A-C-A-V-I-L. Inside the HBC Sports Lab 1 on Twitter and Facebook. And YouTube is Inside the HBC Sports Lab. Make sure you download my JBN, my BCSN. Check us out on YouTube. Follow, like, subscribe. Uh, dream big and continue to move forward. We will talk with you soon. Charles. Of course. Mike. Lecture. Dismissed.